Hello friends, I am Dr. Raman Mittal. I work at the Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. I am going to discuss with you the economic and moral rights which are available as part of the copyright law. Before we go to the nitty gritty of economic and moral rights, let us discuss the general nature of these rights. First, copyright is a bundle of rights. That means there are various rights that are available within the system of copyright. Second, these rights are negative in nature. Negative rights means that the guarantee of law is to the author or the owner is not that the author or owner can exploit the rights himself. The guarantee of law by granting copyright to the author or owner is that he can restrain others from exploiting the work over which he has copyright. That means there is no positive guarantee of law for exploitation of copyright with the owner. For example, if A writes a book which is considered to be blasphemous and goes against the interests of the society, just because he has copyright over the book, because he has created the book, doesn't mean that the law gives him guarantee to exploit the work. Yes, he can always refrain others and restrain others from exploiting his work. Third, the rights which are granted within copyright, they are of exclusive nature. Exclusive rights simply means that law would exclude all others from exploitation of the rights which are granted to one person. The fourth feature of the general feature of these rights is that these rights are transferable in nature. That means these rights, especially the economic rights, barring aside the moral rights, they are transferable. They can pass from one person to another either through contracts or by operation of law. The last aspect, general aspect of these rights is that these rights are fragmentable. That means you can break these rights into different parts and exploit them individually. Let us now see the general framework of rights within the bundle of copyright. Now broadly copyright can be divided into two kinds of rights, economic rights and moral rights. Economic rights are available always to the owner, moral rights are always available to the author. That is the difference between these two rights, the basic difference. Now, Economic rights are also of various kinds, reproduction, distribution, performance in public, communication to the public, adaptation and translation. All these rights are available to the owner of copyright in a work. Now we shall go into a little detail about all these rights. First is the right of reproduction. This right of reproduction is the most fundamental right that emanates from copyright. Right of reproduction basically means the right to make copies. So the name copyright comes from this right. The right to copy means the law grants only the owner exclusively to make copies of his work. Nobody else in the world has the right to make copies of the work that belongs to somebody else. Now all these rights that we have seen, they all belong to the owner. Now, these rights as we have seen right of this reproduction, distribution, performance in public, communication to the public, adaptation and translation, they are available depending upon the category of work. So that means that the rights could vary depending upon which category we are talking about. For example, rights in case of a book would vary from the rights in case of a computer software and they would also vary in case of a cinematograph film. So right of reproduction is such right which is available in case of all the works. All the works means literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works and cinematograph films and sound recordings. Now the examples of right of reproduction are photocopying of a book, copying a computer software program, using a cartoon character on a t-shirt incorporating a portion of another's tune into your new song. So all these are instances of 
right of reproduction. So, if anybody else does any of these things, then he can be held guilty of violation of the copyright or infringement of copyright of the owner. Now, there is a concept of substantial and material copying that means, in order to be held responsible or for infringement of violation of somebody's copyright, it is not necessary that the entire work should have been reproduced. As long as there is a reproduction of substantial or and material part of the whole work, the person who has done so can be held responsible for having infringed the copyright of the owner. Now, could the storage of a of some work in the memory of the computer be the same as reproduction? Yes, this has been specifically provided in section 14 of the Copyright Act of 1957 that the storage by any means including the storage in a computer medium is also reproduction of the work. The second important right within the system of economic rights of copyright is the right of distribution. As was the case with the right of reproduction, right of distribution is also available in case of all the works. Now, how can distribution take place in case of a work, how can its distribution take place? It could take place through sale, through rental, through free lending or through free distribution which is similar to a gift. Through all these ways a work could be reproduced. Now, once we have said that this right is available in case of all the works, but it does not mean that it is available in case of all the works in a similar manner. The availability of this right differs from work to work. Now, it is available in a limited form in case of literary, musical and artistic works. How it is limited in, in case of these works? First, it is subject to the doctrine of first sale or the doctrine of exhaustion. What does it mean? The exact language that is used in the statute in law is of that enumerates this right is that issuing copies of the work to the public not being copies already in circulation. So, the exact nomenclature is issuing copies of the work to the public not being copies already in circulation. That means, the right to issue copies of work to the public that is available with the owner of copyright in literary, musical and artistic works, but this is circumscribed, this is limited by the doctrine of first sale because this does not apply to the copies which are already in circulation. That means, if the copy of a book has been sold already by the owner or his authorized agent, then the buyer of the book can do whatever, can exercise all the rights, can exercise this right of distribution uh, vis a vis that book. For example, if I go to the market and buy a new book, am I free to sell it as second hand version? Yes, because this right is limited. The right of distribution was limited by the doctrine of first sale. That means, the owner of copyright in the book had the right to sell it once and once it was sold, it was already circulated in the market, then the buyer of the book is free, is absolutely free to resell it in the open market. That is the nature of first sale doctrine. Second limitation in case of literary, musical and artistic works vis a vis the right of distribution is that the rental rights are not available. That means, if I go to the market and buy 1000 books, can I start a library of those books where I invite public and charge some fee for the use of my library or for issuance of the books? Yes, the law permits me to do that because there is no rental right that is granted to the owner of copyright in case of literary, dramatic, uh, musical and artistic works. Now, this right is available in a higher form in case of computer programs, films and sound recordings. How it is available in, in the higher form is that there is no exhaustion principle that is applicable in case of computer programs, films and sound recording. Meaning thereby, if I go to the market and buy a CD containing a software, a computer program, I use it for my purpose, I no longer use it, can I sell it in the open market as second hand CD? No, the law does not allow that because this right of distribution as is available to computer programs is not limited by the doctrine of first sale at all. Second, the rental rights are also available to the owners of copyright in computer programs, films and sound recordings. 
That means if I buy two dozen computer programs from the market, can I start a library of those computer programs? No. If I buy 500 CDs containing different films from the open market, my, my purchase is absolutely legal as far as my own use or enjoyment of those films is concerned. But I cannot start a video library with those CDs because the law doesn't give me give law, law doesn't give me that right because this rental right is made exclusively available to the owner of copyright in the film or sound recording or computer programs. With that we come to the third right that is right to communicate a work to the public. This right again as was the case with right of distribution and reproduction this is again available to all the classes of works that is all literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works and sound recordings and films. Now what exactly is communication to public? Section 2 FF defines it. It says communication to the public means making any work or performance available for being, being seen or heard or otherwise enjoyed by the public directly or by any means of display or diffusion other than by issuing copies of it whether simultaneously or at places or times chosen individually regardless of whether any member of the public actually sees, hears or otherwise enjoys the work so made available. Now the activities like broadcasting, webcasting, simulcasting, video on demand etc. they all are covered within the broad framework of communication to the public. That means the order of copyright alone has the right to broadcast it or authorize somebody to broadcast it, to webcast it, to simulcast it or to provide it in any other form. Similarly, exploitation in cinema hall or in a restaurant that is also covered within communication to the public. Uploading, if for example, I buy a CD containing a film, is it possible for me to upload the film on YouTube? legally? Well, that is not because that uploading will become communication to the public. Now if I upload it on my Facebook which is with the settings of public that means it is available to all the people whosoever are members of the Facebook service. Have I infringed the, the right of communication to the public? Yes. Even if nobody watches it on the internet just the aspect of uploading it on the internet would amount to communication of the work to the public because this is the definition says that this is communication to the public is regardless of whether any member of the public actually sees, hears or otherwise enjoys the work so made available. So it is the aspect of making the work available that would amount to communication of the to the public rather than the reception of the work by the public, actual reception by the public. Now important aspects here are making the work available then another important aspect is public. If you make something available privately, something which is not public, then it does not amount to communication to the public. Now the concept of public has not been defined in the statute in our copyright act, but we understand it, what, what public means. We have to use this expression public in contradistinction with the word private. So making a work available within the private circle of close friends or family members may not amount to communication to the public. Another important aspect here is any means because the definition is wide enough to include any means of display or diffusion of a work other than actual issuance of copies of the work to the public because actual issuance of copies of the work to the public is already covered by the right of distribution. Then next right that is available in the bundle of economic rights within section 14 of the statute is the right of adaptation. Now, Adaptation, what exactly is adaptation? Adaptation is a concept which has been defined in the Copyright Act 1957. It could be various aspects could form adaptation. One is if you change the form, if you convert a work into another work, for example, if you convert a literary work into a dramatic work or vice versa, that will amount to adaptation. The second is abridgment. If you abridge a work, that is also considered as adaptation. Then transcription of a work, for example, you transcribe musical work that is covered within the definition of adaptation. Any sort of rearrangement of a work is adaptation and any alteration is also an adaptation. So if anybody except the owner of copyright in a work 
does any of these things then it would be called an adaptation and if he does so without permission he would be infringing the exclusive right of adaptation which is available to the owner of a work. Now this right of adaptation is available not for all the works it is available only for literary dramatic musical and artistic works it is not available in case of computer programs films and sound recordings. Now there was an interesting case regarding this right of adaptation the name of the case is Macmillan and Company Limited versus K and J Cooper in 1920s it was decided by the Privy Council which is the high which was at that time the highest court of appeal for all civil and criminal cases arising from India. Now the facts of this case are something like this Macmillan and Company had produced a book the title of the book was Life of Alexander the Great. Now how they had produced the book we will come to it a bit later but what was their case they had filed a suit against the defendants K and J Cooper and company because K and J Cooper and company the defendants had copied their book verbatim and also added a few notes of themselves. Now what was the case was filed under the theory of copyright infringement so in such cases the first question to be asked of the plaintiff by the, the court in this case the privy council was how establish you, whether your work is a copyright protected work or not because if the work is not copyright protected there is no question of its infringement. So while explaining or demonstrating to the court that how their work is copyright protected they had to demonstrate how the work was created. Now how the plaintiff's book the life of Alexander the Great was created this book was drawn from a public resource that means some material which was out of copyright domain was available to be freely copied by anybody from the public domain. So the, the plaintiffs had chosen such a work now what they had done they had reduced the corpus of the original work that means if the corpus of the original work was 40,000 words they had choose, chosen to copy 20,000 words that means they omitted half the work half the work. So how this work was reduced into half it is very important to understand because they chose certain paragraphs in from the original work. Now if there was say for example if there were 1000 paragraphs they chose 500 paragraphs wherever they chose a particular paragraph they chose it whole and wherever they omitted a particular paragraph they omitted it completely. So that means the plaintiff's work was a work of selection selection of half the paragraphs from the work which was publicly available to be copied by anybody because it was in public domain. Now this entire work of the plaintiff was verbatim copied by the defendants. Now the plaintiffs alleged that this amounts to copyright infringement. Now the plaintiff's work in order to be entitled to copyright has to be covered within the definition of adaptation because if it is adaptation then adaptation commands independent copyright like a new work. Now all the plaintiff had to establish was their exercise of reducing the corpus of the work reducing the size of the work is covered within the uh, within the concept of abridgment as is defined in the copyright act of that time. So in order to find out whether this is abridgment or not in the copyright sense the Privy Council depended upon a classic work on copyright that is a book written by Coppinger and Scone James. Now there it was explained that in order to be entitled to be called an abridgment in order to be entitled to become an author of an abridgment the entire sense of the work must be preserved in a lesser corpus of the work that means you should reduce the size of the work by maintaining the message by keeping the message entire message of the work the language used should be substantially different any sort of mechanical omission cutting of the work and preserving the rest of the work would not amount to abridgment of the work but in case of the the plaintiffs this exactly was the case they had only cut certain portions of the work and kept and preserved the others. So the Privy Council held that this is not a case of abridgment at all if it was not a case of abridgment the defendant could not be said to have violated the copyright of the plaintiff. This was decided in this fashion and we still follow the reasoning of this case that means independent effort some sort of independent effort skill and labor must be apparent in case 
somebody wants to become an author and owner of a new work. So, in this case because the plaintiffs had only had only omitted certain portions and kept certain other portions of the work, they could not be held to be become held to have become authors of copyright and thereby owners of copyright in the work. Next right that is important is the right of translation. It is available for all literary, dramatic and musical works. It is not available in case of other works. Now, translation as opposed to adaptation has not been defined in the statute. So, for that we can refer to shorter Oxford dictionary for its definition. This dictionary defines translation as the action or process of turning from one language into another. Also the product of this a version in a different language, the expression or rendering of something in another medium or form, transformation, alteration or change. This is how the shorter Oxford dictionary defines adaptation uh, uh, sorry it defines translation. Now, in a case Apple computers incorporation versus computer edge this is an Australian case which was decided in 1980s. It was held that conversion of a source code in a computer program often which is often written in hand into an object code or machine readable language is tantamount to translation. So, translation is a separate right that means separate it has a separate copyright that means if for example, A has written a novel can be translate novel in English language can be translate it in Hindi language without the permission of A the answer is no because translation is an exclusive right that has been granted by law to the owner of copyright in a work. Now, if A authorizes B to translate the work then who shall be the owner of the resultant work? Will the resultant translated work be an original work uh, commanding independent copyright protection? Yes, that is the case of copyright that is what is provided under section 14 of the Copyright Act of 1957. So, if B translates it in Hindi then the copyright would belong to whom? Copyright in the translated work it would belong to B unless there is a contract to the contrary between A and B whereby A could stipulate that the, uh, the owner of the translated work would be A only. Now, with this we come to the second important category of rights that is moral rights. Now, moral rights are in our statute known as authors special rights. Now, they are available as the title suggests they are available only to the author they are not available to owners of copyright. The copyright law marks a distinction between the author and the owner right. Normally the default principle is that the author is the first owner of copyright, but then there are certain exceptions as provided in section 17 of the copyright act. So, moral rights are always available to the author. Now, moral rights are of two kinds attribute right of attribution and the right of integrity right of attribution is also known as right of identification right to be identified as an author right of paternity and second is right of integrity. Now, section 57 defines and gives us the scope of moral rights it is worthwhile giving a reading of section 57 here it says independently of the author's copyright and even after the assignment either wholly or partially of the said copyright the author of the work shall have the following two rights. So, before we go to the, the these rights the nitty gritty of these rights let us first understand the opening part of section 57. It is independent of the author's copyright that means what independent of the author's copyright is that there are situations given under section 17 where author shall not be the first owner they are situations which are exceptions to the default principle of copyright law that says that the author shall be the first owner of copyright, but there are a few situations for example, a person is working in a newspaper as a writer and he writes and creates works in the during the course of his employment where the employment was under a contract of service in such situations if there is no contract to the contrary then the employer becomes the first owner of copyright. Now, this expression in section 57 says that independently of author's copyright that means the model the availability of moral rights with the author is independent of his copyright that means whether he was the first owner or not makes no difference to the availability 
to the grant of moral rights in favor of the author. It remains as it was whether he is the owner or he was the first owner or not. The second expression says and even after the assignment either wholly or partially of the said copyright. We know that copyright like all other assets is transferable. So, even if the author of a work as owner had transferred his copyright in favor of another has sold out in pop as we say in popular parlance had sold out his copyright to another person still this sale or this transfer or this assignment or this license would have no effect on the moral rights of the author. Now, another aspect is that this moral right cannot be sold out. Economic rights are transferable, but moral rights are not transferable. With the understanding of this opening part, let us now move to what the rights are. A to claim authorship of the work. So, the author has the right to be identified as the author, he has a right to claim authorship of the work and B is to restrain or claim damages in respect of any distortion, mutilation, modification or other act in relation to the said work if such distortion, mutilation, modification or other act would be prejudicial to his honor or reputation. Let us understand a little in, in a little detail about these rights. First right is to claim authorship of the work. For example, there is an author who writes a script and he assigns the copyright in the script to a filmmaker. The filmmaker, the producer of the film makes the film and in the cast, in the numbering of the film when the film is shown, he nowhere mentions the name of the script writer. Has the script writer got a right to claim authorship that means can he go to a court of law and whereby he can get a direction issued to the producer of the film to include his name within the cast? Yes, that is the exact meaning of the author's right to claim authorship of the work. So, the author can move the court of law and claim a right as against the person who had made a film because he has used his entire manuscript of for his film. So, he must identify the author of the film. The second right is to restrain or claim damages the right of integrity. If the author has produced a work and thereafter sold the work, has he got the right of integrity? Yes, this right is available in two forms to restrain or to claim damages. In case his work is subjected to distortion, mutilation, modification or any other similar act. If such similar act, such modification, distortion etcetera is or would be prejudicial to his honor or reputation. So, this right is available if there are two ifs and there are two ifs are 1 plus 2. So, the first if is if the work is subjected to distortion, mutilation, modification etcetera and second is plus if such modification or mutilation amounts to a compromise or a prejudice to his honor or reputation. Now, very important case uh, was decided by the Delhi High Court in 2005. The name of the case is Amarnath Segal versus Union of India. So, in this case Amarnath Segal was the plaintiff who was a fa very famous uh, an artist of world renown a very famous sculpture. So, this case is resolved is revolved is revolves around uh, one of the very important official governmental buildings of India that is Vigyan Bhavan. So, in 1957 when Vigyan Bhavan was const constructed newly to house or to organize various uh, international conference where especially the prime minister and the president of India were to be participating. So, in 1957 this building was of Vigyan Bhavan was ready. Now, the then prime minister Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru wanted to decorate this building with a with a with its with its with a mural with a grand mural. So, he personally invited Amarnath Segal an artist of repute a sculptor of international renown to look to come to Delhi and to see if he could do the mural for the building. Amarnath Segal came to Delhi saw the building and agreed to construct a huge mural a huge sculptor an artistic work to be mounted on the main wall of the lobby of Vikyan Bhavan. It took him 6 years to construct a bronze mural and mount it on the wall of the grand lobby of Vikyan Bhavan. Thereafter it remained on the walls of Vikyan Bhavan it continued to decorate the walls for nearly 2 decades. Thereafter the uh, walls of Vikyan Bhavan required 
repainting and some uh, whitewash and some repair. For that purpose, this huge structure, this huge mural, this huge sculpture was pulled down uh, by the at the instance of Union of India because the walls required some repairs and whitewashing. Now, why did they remove it? Why did they break it? Because it was so huge, in order to remove it, it had to be broken because no door was so big as to because it was 140 feet wide and 70 feet um, uh, 140 by 70 feet was huge. So, no door would allow it to pass through. So, in order to get it out of the room, in order to take it out of the room, it had to be broken. That was the logic of the Union of India. So, Mr. Amarnath Segal went to the court against this action of the Union of India. Now, the first thing to be decided under the theory, he went, he approached the court under the theory of violation of his moral rights under section 57 of the act. So, the first question before the court was whether this work was subjected to distortion, mutilation, modification or any similar act. Well, arguments could be raised from both the sides, but ultimately the court decided that it is an extreme form of mutilation because this was destruction. The Union of India destroyed the work. This was uh, this destruction the court held to be an extreme form of mutilation. The reason is because it reduced the creative corpus of the author of a work. If for example, Mr. Amarnath Segal had about a dozen, had a dozen sculptures of this nature around the world which were registered in various art galleries and art books uh, of the world of renown, then he would have only 11 now. So, this reduction on the creative corpus of a famous artist would definitely amount to mutilation in the opinion of the Delhi High Court. The second question was whether this mutilation would be prejudicial to the honor or reputation of Mr. Amarnath Segal. Well, the, the, the court held that certainly because of the same reason, because in the reduction of the creative corpus of the famous author, this amounts to his, uh, to the prejudice, it amounts to be prejudicial to his honor or reputation. So, ultimately the court held it to be um, violative of the action of the Union of India was violative of the moral rights of the author, Mr. Amarnath Segal, even though the author had been paid back, paid for his work long back. So, such is the nature of moral rights. So, in the end, I would like to summarize whatever I had discussed during the course of this lecture. We, through this lecture, we came to understand the nature of copyright, how it is a bundle of copyrights, how various rights are included within this bundle. Broadly, this bundle can be divided into two parts, two kinds of rights, first economic rights, second moral rights. Economic rights further could be divided into rights of reproduction, distribution, communication to the public, translation, adaptation, etc. And moral rights could be divided into rights of integrity and rights of paternity. Now, these rights are fragment, economic rights are fragmentable, they are transferable, whereas moral rights are not. Moral rights are always available to the author of a work. In no case, they are available to anybody else except the author, whereas economic rights are always available to the owner of the work. Thank you very much.